from Dubrovnik. I hope you're having a wonderful weekend and welcome to this month's edition of the Seekers Forum. And let's say hello to Jay Copley. How are you, Jay? Hey, Mark. Feeling, uh, feeling great. Thank you. Good to see you. Nice to see you too. So today we're going to be talking about bringing love and passion to our actions in the world. At a time when many people feel overwhelmed, oppressed by necessity, finances, expectations, and this haunting sense of never quite catching up with themselves, it's so important to take a step back and ask ourselves why we're doing what we're doing and how we are doing it. Are we using our time and energy for things that truly matter to ourselves and other people? Are we passionate about what we do? Are we present? Are we emotionally truthful in bringing our full self to the actions that we take? Or do we feel as if we're being driven by meaningless activities and the need to stay busy no matter what, like the proverbial dog being wagged by its tail? The practice of self-inquiry enables us to address questions like these, life-altering questions, truthfully, in order to scrutinize our own motivations and the intentions driving what we do. That teaches us that the quality of our actions, indeed the quality of our lives, are determined by how much of our hearts we bring to our own activities, how much love, and whether or not we truly care. Unfortunately, we rarely think of love as the bottom line for deciding what we do and what we don't do, gauging the quality of our own activities. How much tenderness do we bring to our moment-by-moment -moment responses? Do we view ourselves and others through the eyes of love? Or do we see the world through harsh, judgmental, ungenerous eyes? Are our hearts open most of the time? Are they receptive? Or are they obstructed by a lack of interest, a lack of commitment, a lack of caring? Do we experience a fundamental willingness toward our own existence? Or do we feel like we're being dragged through our lives, sort of inveigled against our will, and impacted by uncontrollable events that leave us feeling either ambivalent or even apathetic? Seekers learn that through wisdom practices like self-inquiry, we realize that love governs how we see. And we learn also that our impact in the world is profoundly affected by the quality of that gaze. Action that arises from seeing life's beauty is bound to result in the good. Actions that arise from a closed heart is very likely to do good for anyone. The poet Rabindranath Tagore said that beauty is reality seen through the eyes of love. Beauty is reality seen through the eyes of love. In other words, loving what we do, however menial uh, the tasks might be, reveals the beauty of reality to us. This revelation of truth and goodness deepens our ability to feel passion. And passion is the lifeblood of our existence. Now, passion is one of those words that lands differently for different people. For some people, when they hear the word passion, they think about sex and love. Others hear passion and they think extreme up and down emotion and drama. Still other people in the Christian tradition sometimes can associate passion with the traditional meaning of Latin coming from pain, passion coming from pain, the passion of the Christ and so on. And yet passion, which includes a passion for awakening is absolutely necessary for living an evolving life. This passion can be quiet and personal. It can be unemotional. And it can manifest in the simple sense of doing good and being good, being who we are, uh, where we are without self-censorship. In the words of an 18th century philosopher, an homme sans désir et passion cesserait d'être un homme, a man without desires or passions would cease to be fully human. 
a person without desires or passion ceases to be fully human. Listen, last week when I interviewed Gabor Maté for the June interview for the Seekers Forum, I asked him what he thinks about passion and why he believes that passion is or isn't important. Gabor just looked at me with those eyes of his. I don't know if you've seen Gabor Maté, but he has this haunting face that looks like he's sort of been through hell and back, which in a sense, as a Hungarian Jew who barely escaped the Holocaust, he has. And what he said to me is this. He said, passion is a flame that burns within without consuming you. He likes to compare a passion to the burning bush in the Bible. He said that it heats, it illuminates, it guides, it enlivens, and it inspires. And it is not to do with the ego. This was a big point. It's not about the ego. He was saying that even in the midst of the worst that life can give us, the ability to feel passion and to transcend our own selfish needs and to experience a genuine affection for our own existence is absolutely critical to getting through. What's more, as most of you know, people who have lost the most, seen the worst, and yet survive, very often live with a more urgent love of their own lives and have much more to give back to others than folks who haven't been tested quite so much. Gabor exemplifies this himself. In his healing of his own trauma, he has helped millions of people around the world as a renowned specialist in trauma and addiction to heal their own wounds, to face their own vulnerability, to change their stories about who they are and thus sees existence with a renewed vitality. There's a direct link between confronting the worst in ourselves and others and feeling passion for the world, feeling the gratitude for the immeasurable gift of our own existence. This confrontation frees the heart and it liberates the love that is nascent within us. This enables us to serve life which in turn serves the highest in ourselves, that dimension of the self that we call spiritual. When I asked Gabor what he thinks about spirituality as a precursor to enlightened action, he just gave me a slight smile and said, what do you think spirituality is? He said, as human beings, we naturally want to belong, to attach, to feel connected, to feel ourselves part of the totality of things. Is that spiritual or is that just human? I suggested that it's probably both. And he said, maybe, maybe not. But at the end of the day, what does it matter what we call it? We both agreed that in fact, it's just semantics. Whether we call it spirituality, whether we call it just being fully human, it doesn't matter. When you're connected to the immensity, which some people call God, and the love that's pulsating at its core, Unhesitant, willing action takes place within you without needing to force it. You learn to practice getting out of the way for love, whether you're doing something significant or merely tending to the chores of the day. Your attention makes it tender and worthwhile and worth paying attention to. This works even when you're doing something unpleasant. This is really important. This is actually more important, I think. Because so much of what we do brings a resistance and aversion to us. For example, let's say you're forced to spend time with people whose opinions or personalities you find very difficult. For example, my mother-in-law, whom I love, is a staunch, fox-watching, right-wing Republican, whom I care a lot about. Unfortunately, the things that she believes and the things she doesn't believe appall me on a regular basis. Listening to her talk over dinner about how Trump really won the election, how racism really isn't a thing, how guns don't kill people, people do. I can feel this outrage boiling up inside me. I can actually feel my hands clenching into fists underneath the table. I'm aware of my amygdala freaking out, pushing me to fight or play dead or leave the room in a hurry to escape this aversion one way or the other. 
But what is a son-in-law to do? We're barely halfway through the meal. I need to sit here for at least another half hour without choking or throwing something or getting angry. And there's only one way that I've finally learned to do this. And that is seeing Beverly through the eyes of love. I train myself to take deep breaths and I look at her for who she really is, what she really is. She's a lonely, frightened woman with chronic pain every day of her life who has been brainwashed by an ideology. She's a widow who's still grieving the loss of her husband. She's a woman who was raised in the 1940s who was never taught critical thinking or seeing beyond her circumscribed world. And that helps me to see Beverly as someone who is suffering rather than the enemy. It's not that the outrage goes away. What she says is still annoying, but it's no longer the primary focus. I don't love the experience by any means, but I do love her. And that's the difference. The affection helps me sit there 90% of the time, mostly present and without wanting to throttle someone. Now, this is a relatively minor example of a universal principle, which is that when you add affection to how you see, it alters your experience dramatically. It raises your personal frequency, which in turn shifts the quality of your intention. When you're engaged in positive experiences, of course, the same holds true. It's only in more intensified. If you bring love to the things that you enjoy, your sense of purpose increases many fold. The Japanese have a concept for this that they call ikigai. Ikigai refers to the feeling of rightness and goodness and accomplishment in life that comes when we bring passion to what we do. Such activities are never forced on an individual. Instead, they feel spontaneous and they feel that they are undertaken willingly. Things that make us feel ikigai depend on a person's inner self. It's related to what the French call raison d'être, reason for being, which touches into our depths. It's not about necessarily surface pleasures. Ikigai evolved from the Japanese principles of traditional medicine, in fact. This medical tradition holds that physical well-being, as well as emotional and psychological well-being, is affected by a sense of purpose in life. That's different from mere transitory pleasures. Ikigai has more to do with the life that's well-lived, which leads to the most lasting form of happiness. They describe it as waking up to joy, to entering our flow, to having the sense of being at our best. But here's the important part. In order for ikigai to happen, the actions that we take need to transcend our personal fulfillment and include the love that we feel for others and for society as a whole. In order for what you do to enlighten you, it can't just be for yourself. It has to consider the greater good. This consciousness of interdependence is what separates ikigai from selfishness or hedonism. Traditional teachings trace Ikigai to, quote, embracing the joy of little things, being in the here and now, having a frame of mind that one can build a happy and active life. Let me just repeat that. The things that bring us Ikigai are all about embracing the joy of little things, being in the here and now, and having a frame of mind that one can build a happy and an active life. Our frame of mind is everything. It's also no surprise that the Japanese link this quality of Ikigai to longevity, as well as to improved mental health. Conscious action harmonizes the body and the mind and the spirit, and it balances our relationships with other people as well. It turns us into a channel for grace, for manifesting purpose through love. So the question is, how does a person find her Ikigai? I'd like to suggest six questions that we can ask ourselves as we practice making this connection between passion and action and awakening. First of all, ask yourself, 
Do you believe that love can be the bottom line for everything that you do in your life? Do you believe that love can be the bottom line for everything that you do in your life? Or do you view this as a kind of a fantasy, a whitewashing, rose-colored glasses delusion? Your response to this question will tell you a great deal about the level of your own cynicism, how much you trust your own heart, as well as your deep-seated beliefs about human nature. If you have a fundamentally pessimistic view of human nature, it's going to be very hard to swallow the idea that love needs to be the bottom line, the gauge by which you measure your actions. And that leads us to question number two. Do you equate a loving perspective with a loss of discernment? Do you equate a loving perspective with a loss of discernment? A lot of people close their hearts because they fear being taken for a fool. They're afraid of being duped by insincerity or being hurt because they trust too much. So ask yourself, do you ever confuse kindness with ignorance? And conversely, do you equate toughness with strength and power and intelligence? Are you dubious of love and generosity? Do you look at generosity and love coming at you with skepticism? And if so, how does this serve you in your life? How do you use judgment to prop up your ego at the expense of your happiness? Or do you alienate others and isolate yourself uh, within the prisons of your own rigid opinions, unwilling to open, to soften, to consider, and to absorb? Question three. Do you judge your life or do you experience it fully? That's a big one. Are you busy forming stories and opinions about things before you've actually felt them? Is there a reflexive judgment? And how does that affect a sense of feeling alienated in your life, feeling shut away from the vitality of who you are? Are you thinking your life or are you living your life? Are you judging your life or are you feeling your life? Because trapped inside our own stories, we can't love and we can't love life because we're too busy narrating it. We're too busy putting it in a box. We're too preoccupied with fearing the future or obsessing over the past. Question number four, do you give with a free and willing heart? Are you able to give with a free and a willing heart? And that means not only to others, but also to yourself and to your own experience. Or are you someone who's always counting the beans, tit for tat, protecting yourself against feeling vulnerable? Are you generous with life or do you play it safe? Do you keep your cards close to your chest and share as little as possible? Or are you able to be more forthcoming? and more connective with other people. Are you miserly with yourself? Do you refuse to give even yourself what you need? Do you not pay attention to what needs caring for? And if so, why do you do that? Why are you withholding with yourself? Whose pattern are you continuing to enact? And how does this self-refusal affect your well-being? Be as specific as you can be when you're answering that question. Question five, do you believe that pleasure is selfish? It's a bit connected to how you see human nature. Are you trained to default to self-judgment when you're feeling pleasure? Or have you trained yourself toward enjoyment and curiosity and satisfaction? Do you react negatively, automatically? Or do you tend to see what's possible and what is there? Most of us have come into contact with people who manage to find pleasure in most things and others who, no matter what's happening, it's never quite enough. It's never good enough or sufficient to make that inner longing, that pain go away. I see this with people all the time, folks who appear to have so much, who you imagine would be so grateful for their lives, but are miserable no matter what happens. And there are others with heavy, heavy loads of care who manage to find satisfaction in what they do. Understanding this habit, the mind's habit of turning pleasure to pain, 
is absolutely essential if we want to live a happy life. And finally, question number six, what interferes with you loving what you do today? What interferes with you loving what you do today? What gets in the way of passion? What blocks the flow of good feeling? What are the stories associated with these obstacles, these internal blocks, these deep seated narratives about who you are and who you're not? What you believe about the nature of spirit? And whether you believe that happiness is possible, because a lot of people don't believe that happiness is possible. A lot of folks don't even think that happiness is the purpose of our lives here. Do you believe that surrendering the selfish will is, in fact, a person's greatest strength? Or does that feel like a fool's errand, a way of disempowering ourselves and leaving us exposed to harm? Do you believe that happiness is your birthright more than possibility? Do you believe that happiness is actually your birthright, the reason that you're here? Or do you think that well-being, in fact, your existence, is something that needs to be earned? Something that you're not quite worthy of yet, but you may be in the future if you manage to jump through this hoop or that hoop. These are critical questions to understanding what obstructs passion in our lives what gets in the way of good feeling, self-belief, confidence, and love. Love in its many different forms. These questions will take you a long way toward this experience of ikigai and the habit of loving what you do. So let's now do a little bit of writing together. Jay, why don't you pull up that question and we will... Good. I'd like you now, please, to take 15 minutes to write about whether you judge your life or you experience it fully. Are you sitting back narrating and judging your life or are you experiencing it? And how does this habit affect your well-being? Be as specific as you can be, please. We'll take 15 minutes and then we'll come back together as a group. 